Okay. Okay, cool. So you got it? <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay, awesome. Sweet. Okay, so now just a little bit about me. Uh, you're, you're looking at this image here that is kind of horrific. Uh, I'm going to go into that in just a second. But just before I do a little bit about me, uh, uh, I am a visual artist of, of about 20 years. I'm also a professor at Mountain View College. Uh, but full time, I work for a data analytics company. And um, I, I don't want to go into that too much. But one of the things that we're trying to do is, is use uh, big data to hold municipalities accountable, uh, as well as uh, heads of businesses. Because at the end of the day, we're all people. We're a community and we need each other and we can benefit from working together. And, and so that's kind of a little bit about what I do. Uh, this, this um, back to this, this content right here, uh, this comes from the 1700s, the late 1700s. And uh, this is a woodcut that's depicting mass murder that happened um, uh, in, in response to trying to stay alive, in essence. And because of the perspective of the uh, people on this ship and the, and the going perspective of really the culture at large being that uh, the enslaved were property, they were th literally throwing people overboard uh, to drown uh, just to conserve water and resources. All right, so this conversation that we're having today uh, is going to be about art and race. Uh, and by the end of this workshop, you're going to better understand the establishment of racist ideas through art, uh, but also how artists have responded to those ideas. Okay. Uh, now, as I mentioned, this is from the 1700s, uh, but I want you to keep in mind something that is, is pretty alarming. So racist ideas in, in, in context to uh, the kind of racist racism that we understand as uh, anti-blackness, if you will, or just putting people that are darker skin in a cast. Well, this kind of stuff, it, it happened much earlier than this, even, if you will. So around, this, around the 1400, so this, so ideologies of, of race and racist ideas have been in play long before this, this, uh, this woodcut. And a woodcut, if you're not familiar with what that is, uh, it's where an artist takes a block of wood and uh, creates a drawing on top of that block of wood and uh, carves away all of the areas that are gonna show up as the tonality of the paper. So like if you see here, the, uh, like the spaces between the lines uh, and the lightness of faces, that would be just the, the color of the paper, right? And then everything else is the ink, okay? Does that make sense? And um, so once you finish carving that away, you ink up what's called the wood block or the plate, and then you put a piece of paper on top of that, and uh, then you rub or you, you rub on, the, you rub uh, applying pressure, excuse me, uh, to the back of the paper. And then uh, you pull the paper off and then you have to print, right? Uh, another way that they would do it is they would just run this through a press. And so by this time period, they have presses. And, and so they're, they're uh, mass producing these images by comparison to how it would have been done prior to having a press. Because prior to having a press, even though they were prints being made, they were all done by hand, okay? So I'm saying this in context to uh, just to create the idea that Art like this is pretty pervasive, right? And, and, that's, and that's as late as the 1700s, all right? Okay. Uh, so I wanna talk about just some, just some goals for us today. Um, but before I do that, let me, let me just open it up. Do you guys have any questions at all about what I just said or about my work or anything. We all still there? I don't have any questions. All right. Okay. 
So let's go on to the next one. Cool. Okay. So, so again, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about art and race, and we're going to identify some key texts. Uh, and then we're going to connect ideas, those racist ideas with art, and then we're going to spend some time analyzing and critiquing those ideas. Uh, below in the slide there, that's a link to my website. Uh, and, and if you can see that, it's kind of hard to see, but it basically just says uh, davidmichaelconnolly.com. And if you want the chance to look at the kind of work that I do, you just click on that, uh, I'm sorry, not click on that link, just go to that website and you'll see the kind of work that I do. All right. All right, you can go to the next one. Okay, so let's start talking a little bit about these texts here. Uh, so the first one, this is a more contemporary text. Uh, this is a text by Dr. Ibram Kendi. Has anybody, is anyone familiar with this text stamp from the beginning? And really, we're going to start off here just talking about contemporary history books on race and racist ideas uh, and how they've shaped everything. All right, so this book, it's, it's really long, but it's going to be very difficult to put down. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, when I started reading books like this, to be quite honest, I, I, I went through this period of mourning. I had to go through this period of mourning. And I went through this period of mourning because it, it's kind of like in the Matrix where uh, Lawrence Fishburne's character says to Keanu Reeves' character, Neo, you've been living in a dream world, Neo. <laughs> You know, and it, and it took me quite some time to just uh, uh, reconcile how, how I was living in a narrative, how I was living in a narrative about identity, about race, uh, the, the, the stories that I had conflated together in my mind about people uh, were, were wrong, right? Were wrong. And, and it was incredibly, actually, after a while, after going through like the five stages of grief, if you will, uh, the, the thing that ended up happening was I, I was actually kind of relieved. Um, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s, well, really, I'm kind of spanning 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, I experienced a lot of racism. I experienced uh, racism from teachers, from principals, from coaches, from, um, from, peers. Uh, I would get into fights, you know, over other people's racist ideas. I remember being in class just kind of squirming in my seat because of the way that the content uh, that was being taught was taught. And everybody's kind of looking at me like I'm the devil in the class. You know, just to, just to, just to quickly quote uh, one of my favorite authors, James Baldwin. Um, James Baldwin talked about how when he was a kid, he used to he used to watch what he would call cowboys and Indians on TV, right? Uh, he would watch shows like Gunsmoke and back in the back in the uh, 60s and 70s, you had these TV shows, we had a cowboy that was always chasing this Native American around. It's incredibly uh, just offensive. But at the same time, you know, this is what was on TV. And uh, James Baldwin said, I always saw myself uh, as, as the cowboy. I didn't know until later that I was the Indian. <laughs> and that's been kind of me in my life. I really resonated with that, you know, as I, as I read uh, those words from him. And so similarly, you're going to find some things in this book that might be very difficult, but helpful because it's like, oh, well, that makes sense. Oh, well, that explains a lot. And, and so just to kind of talk a little bit about what this book is doing, um, in this book, Dr. Kendi has, has been able to track racist ideas down, not just to the time period, but to the person. And that is really, really powerful because it humanizes this stuff and it reminds us that these are ideas, right? And so this is where we're getting at um, the, the, the notion that race uh, in this context is mythological, right? There's, there's, there's a, it's a mythological construct. And 
you really see this laid bare in a text like this. It's incredibly thorough. It's very, very well written. Uh, and it makes it easy to see that. So far, so good? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so the next one, the next one up is Christ Divided, uh, Anti-Blackness as Corporate Vice by Dr. Katie Walker Grimes. It's also a remarkable work, but in this one, uh, it's a scientific work of, of cultural anthropology, uh, and she, in a scholarly way, studied the church's role, uh, and mostly the Catholic church at this point, in shaping the imagination about race uh, for the church. And, and also this book serves as a detailed explainer and critique of how the church has shaped the imagination about race and, in, and enforced it from primarily like within the Catholic traditions. And, and, it's, and the thing here is like, what what's helpful is there's a there's a distinction between theology there's this, there's a distinction between theology and how it's practiced by powerful individuals and it's these individuals that end up poisoning the theology right and so again it's very similar to to stamped but it's more on the on the church side right and, and along that same line you have reforging the white republic uh, this book is written by Dr. Ed Bloom. This one was actually one of the first ones that I read uh, of these books that, that are, that are um, on this slide. And there's so many more. I'm leaving off so many, right? In fact, there's, there's one that's, gr that's a great one for high school students. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's titled, if I'm, I'm, I might get this wrong, uh, but it's, uh, and this is just as an aside here. Uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me. Are you familiar with that book? Are you guys familiar with that book? I've heard it, but I've never actually learned more about it. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an incredible way to look at just, just um, a high school history curriculum uh, and, and just to kind of help you as a high school student to be more informed about the way that textbooks are made uh, and how decisions get made as far as what goes in those textbooks. Uh, but then it, it kind of lets you in on the whole process of, of uh, just scientific research that historians go through. And, and it gives you access to the actual history, not, not just allow you to rely on the textbook itself. But anyway, I'm getting off topic here. So Reforging the White Republic is, is also a really hard look at this history, but it, but it focuses more specifically on the time period between 1865 and 1898, all right? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's going to, for us, uh, uh, just bring to light the coordinated work to bring slavery back in everything but name, okay? Uh, that's what's going on in this book. And the next book, The Color of Law, I would say that this is, this is, canvassing a more contemporary time as in like uh, we're talking the late 30s uh, through today. And in this book, uh, what we're looking at is how the government, it, it segregated our country, right? And it used, uh, really it used money to do that. Uh, and, and there's this amazing coordination between law uh, and uh, finance, all right? And so that's what's going on in this book, okay? And uh, the term that you're gonna hear a lot in this book is de jure segregation. And that term, de jure segregation is a legal term and that uh, means legalized segregation, okay? And so it, it's really quite astounding what you're gonna find out about why it is so hard in some areas uh, for, for people of color to get into those areas, even to this day. Why is so, why it is so hard to get loans to live, uh, to buy a home, to live in a certain area to this day. It's quite incredible. Um, but again, like I, like I had said previously, this kind of information for me, it was kind of like, oh, that makes sense, right? And so what we're doing right now, just to kind of keep us connected to really the goal of this is to identify key texts in uh, those racist ideas that have largely shaped our reality, okay? So the next book here in this slide is White Too Long, and that's a more recent book. 
Uh, and that book is by Robert P. Jones. And it's also a look at the church. Now, I'm talking about the church as an aside here, right? This, in, in a, and I feel kind of bad doing that. I don't want to, to paint this picture as though the church is this, you know, evil um, menace in the world. It's quite the opposite, right? It's quite the opposite. Um, but there have been things that have happened that um, people have done that have done these things um, as a way to maybe even redefine the church um, and, and shape our imagination about Jesus, shape our imagination about Christianity. <clears throat> and so it's important to point these things out so that we can make those distinctions between um, a historic Christianity, for example, and things that people have done in our country years ago to shape the imagination and the narrative of what it means to be a Christian. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because this stuff is very near and dear to our hearts, right? This, is, this stuff is very much so um, how we identify with our families. It's how we identify with the world outside. This is, this is about identity. And so it's incredibly powerful, right? So I want to go back to this. This, is, this book is written um, more uh, to, to address or critique the behavior of the Southern Baptist Church. This is more on the evangelical, right? more on the evangelical side, okay? All right, now, down below that, oh, and by the way, the, the writer, he grew up in the, in the Southern Baptist tradition and in the evangelical church, and so it's really powerful to have a firsthand account of his own experiences, but also from the perspective of a scholar who wanted to better understand um, his own church history, right? And so that led him on the journey that he went on in order to write this book okay and and in short this is kind of a, a conflation of of whiteness and christ likeness if you will okay and when i say whiteness i'm talking about the ideology right i'm talking about this idea of like white supremacy for instance i'm talking about how uh there is this kind of godliness or um power hierarchy, right? This is an ideology. This is a, this is a racist idea that, <clears throat> excuse me, that was made for a very specific purpose a long, long time ago and has evolved into, um, into all kinds of policies and laws and behaviors and ways of seeing life and ways of seeing God. It's incredible, right? So, but ideas, Right? And like the quote that I have on the slide, ideas have consequences. Uh, and and that's, that's a very, very um, important thing to remember. Ideas can be incredibly powerful in shaping our reality. Okay, so below that, we have some contemporary art books, right? And just, you know, I kind of do this as a, as a, as a professor. Sometimes I, um, I spend time just talking about seems like I spent a lot of time talking about text, but I do this because I'm interested in empowering my students, right? I'm putting this information out there saying, hey, you know, over the course of the next several days, weeks, months, years of your life, if, if, if you want to dig into this and drill down deep into this stuff yourself, kind of like I have, here's, some, here's, some, here's a good place to start, right? And so that's kind of the idea here. And these books, these contemporary art books, are what I would call responses to racist ideas that have shaped our world, where artists are responding and they're giving pushback. In one sense, the pushback is just, just, just kind of being very vulnerable and open to, to how uh, people have had to survive. You know, you, you almost have to become this magician to transform yourself, right? There's something alchemical about transitioning yourself into a creature that can live in this environment. You know, uh, Dave Chappelle said that, you know, it's a miracle to survive this nightmare. <laughs> you know, if you're a person of color in certain ways, right? And, and so uh, this next book, uh, this, this book by uh, William Cordova, this uh, book is titled, Now is the Time, Narratives of Southern Alchemy. Uh, and it's really kind of this journey by this cultural anthropologist as an artist to, to mine all of those conflations of identity uh, through objects in writing, right? 
And so he has incredibly powerful work. We're going to hear from him perhaps later, a little bit later. Uh, and then the next one down is Black Refractions, highlights from the Studio Museum in Harlem. Uh, and it's a catalog of a traveling exhibition featuring about 100 uh, works of art from 80 different artists. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of stuff as an art maker, as a young person, man, I long to have. I long to see art made by people that look like me, but it's like, man, it was nowhere. It wasn't in museums. It wasn't in books. You know, I just, I just kind of felt like this alien, <laughs> you know, who just didn't really fit anywhere. Uh, and it's, incre it's incredibly isolating and you, you feel very alone. But, co but content like this is powerful to just kind of show that, no, there are people like you that uh, are really challenging these norms. There are people like you that you are in community with that are doing a lot of the same things that you want to do. You know, so anyway, it's a very powerful uh, way to get into uh, just what other artists were doing. And so these are just kind of my, my heroes in art right now. These uh, younger, some of them are younger, some of them are older, some of them are passed on, right? So that's that book. And then the next one after that uh, is this book, Out of Order, Out of Sight. And it's written by uh, an art critic and an artist. Her name is Adrienne Piper. Uh, and it's kind of a scathing critique of mainstream art, uh, art criticism in American culture over the last 25 years. The next one, Grief and Grievance is a text that is, is like uh, Black Refractions. It's a traveling exhibition. And it was put together by Okwi in Wazor. He passed away, I want to say a couple of years ago, but it's an amazing work, a very powerful work, just kind of um, pulling together just this intergenerational uh, exhibition of, of artwork. And then lastly, uh, Latinx Art, Artists, Markets, and Politics by Arlene Avila is, you know, it's a, it's a text that draws on a number of, of interviews and uh, interviews of artists and dealers and curators where they're all trying to explore the problem of visualizing Latinx art and artists, you know, but then also what she does is really take a critical look at the global contemporary art market. All right. So those are just some texts for starters. Again, like I said, there's so many, so many more. Uh, and uh, I just felt like I had to cover those key texts. All right. So I have a couple of questions. And I think that the answers to these questions will help us. The, this portrait over here is of Herodotus. And Herodotus uh, has been called the father of history. I would disagree with that title. <laughs> <laughs> because history uh, uh, had been recorded by griots uh, forever, long before Herodotus and other traditions. But in Western culture, that's the title that he was giving, given. And so I just wanted to say that he's one of the, well, I'd say he's, he's considered as the first one to put pen to paper to write down a history uh, of, of the Greeks, right? And their conflict with Persia. Okay, do, do, are, we, are we familiar with Herodotus? You guys? No, not really. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, anyway, so, but what is history though? You know, what, what would you say is history? Um, I would say history is like anything from the past basically. Okay, from the past. Good, I appreciate that. Thank you for, for saying that. Any, anyone else have a thought on what history is? It definitely involves the past. Um, what else could history be? Um, I think it could mean, like, you know the saying that goes like, oh, we're making history right now. So I think it could mean, like, you're doing something important, important, you know? Right, right. Yeah, and, and what... What defines the thing as important, you know, and, and how do you keep track of that? Why would you keep track of that? I think history, like different history is important for different people. So like, we can't just like, you know, like pack everything up and say like, you know, like what you did is not important because everything that everybody does is important in a way because it does affect like how everything's gonna happen. So 
I feel like what's important is like, however, whatever you think is important is what's going to be important in history. That's what I think. Yeah, definitely. I think so. I mean, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the thing that Herodotus has thought too. Like this is very important to us. And so I need to write it down. Right. <clears throat> but then what am I writing down? And how do I know that what I'm writing down is accurate? So he would go around and he would ask people, he would, he would take ships to different places and he would, and he would do these, you know, what we would consider as interviews. And he would take all that information and he put it together and he'd compare it. Right. So this is one of the first times that, that you have history as a science, right? Where somebody is comparing these stories, do they match up? And how well do they match up? I mean, are they just these incredibly inflated tales on one side and, <clears throat> and are they just more sort of flatly accurate on another side, that kind of a thing. And, you know, he has uh, probably quite a mixture of both right in his writing uh, but but that's but this is really the first time that history is kind of seen as a science right we want to take like you mentioned we want to take those important things and we want to we want to we want to capture them for all time and so how do we do that we have to do that by being as accurate as possible and how are we as accurate as possible we have to find the documents right we have to find all the documents you have to we have to pull together all the stories and you have to organize all that information and then we're going to present it after that, right? And we're going to let the story of this content, it's kind of like what I do, right? In this data world, you know, we take all this information and we synthesize it and organize it and collate it and put it together in reports, right? That's kind of what historians do. It's like this science. So it's not my opinion. It's the story of the content itself coming out, right? So you're right. It's all this stuff that's important, but we have to, we've, we've got to, we've got to put a face on it, right? We've got to like, We've got to have it live in a way that is forever. And so we're going to put it in a language, but we have to make sure that what we're saying is accurate. Along that line, I have another question. What is art? Who wants to take a stab at that one? I mean, is art kind of like history perhaps? I would say yes. Um, I feel like art in itself is a language or like some sort of preservation. Like when we think about uh, like the codices, which is basically pictorial writings, which because they're images, they can be considered art. Um, they're a language that indigenous folks used to use to communicate. So I think it's a different way of recording um, history that maybe shows us a little more perspective of the lived experiences of people. I appreciate that answer. Uh, I, I think that that's spot on accurate. You know, it's this kind of um, uh, it's this kind of way to visualize that history in the language, right? It's like, and it's and it's the it's the intent to do that. We're going to put it in a particular form, right? Um, and yeah, it's it's considered as a closed document, like like writing is. In some cases, it's it's even more reliable than writing. Right, because it, it can give us some ideas as to what people wore, uh, what their environment was like, you know, certain um, certain important uh, stylistic kind of uh, arrangements, practices, and so on. So yeah. Now, what is race? Race, as everyone defines it, is like where you're from, what color your skin is, the language you speak, you know, like physical, basically like physical appearances. And is, is race something that has been around forever or would you, would you, I mean, this is kind of referencing something that I was talking about earlier. Is this something that we all just kind of know, but we don't know how to describe it? Or is this something that we could consider as an ideological construct? I think race is an ideological construct because like, you know, I have, I have, no, I didn't read a book. It was like, I don't know what it was, but it was something. And like, I was looking through it and it was like, um, race, like basically race, like, but it started when like, the, 
I don't know how to describe it, so I'm just gonna say white people. It started when the white people came over here and they like took the Africans from Africa and there was like and that that like basically was the um foundation of racism because they the white people deemed everybody else as inferior to them and they just felt like they were all powerful and that's like basically where racism came from because I um so I read the Bible, but anyways, like in the Bible, it didn't say anything about like racism, like you're this race or you're like this or you're this or you're like that. And it didn't say anything about racism. So I think it was like all based off a of white person perception and they just perceive like, oh, look, look at me. I'm this color and look at you. You're that color. So like, you know, so I think like racism is just like an ideological, you know? Yeah. Yep. No, that's great. With that, let's go to the next slide and let's take a look at this in action. Let's take a look at this um, happening, what you basically described. And so what you're looking at in this next slide here uh, in a second is uh, what's called uh, a Costa painting. Can we go to the next one? Ready to go. <laughs> I'm like, Leto, can you change it? His cam. Okay, there we go. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so th this is what's called a Costa painting, and Costa, you know, has to do with lineage, right? But this is one of the earliest examples of what we're talking about. This ideological construct put to form. And uh, if we can go to the next one, you can see a detail of this. Just so that it's like a little bit, yeah. So what, um, what preceded this painting by, you know, over a couple hundred years, if you will, what was a distinction between peoples and uh, it really kind of started, if, you know, if we're talking specifically about Spain and, and, and about Portugal, it started specifically with the Portuguese who uh, sought to differentiate their own people from African slaves being uh, taken uh, from their homes in, in, in Africa, okay? And they had this problem because uh, uh, they had this problem of, well, all of us look very similar. <laughs> and, and how are we gonna do this? You know, how are we going to, you know, base distinctions on race? And they came up with this idea of, of calling the, uh, the kidnapped and human trafficked enslaved people, they called them the slave race, and then they called themselves uh, uh, people of these different castes, right? And so these castes that are defined by color uh, was really this was really a Portuguese kind of idea that was that was later empowered by uh, the uh, imperial Spanish royalty. Um, yeah. So so it was so this painting just to kind of put this in perspective. This painting is from the 18th century. <laughs> so just think about that for a second. You know. Uh, first of all, how old it is, right? This is like 1700s, okay? But, but also think about what I just said about the 1400s, right? So 1400s, 1700s, you have this idea that's been around a long time. So by the time it gets to these artists who are depicting this uh, in these Costa paintings, um, you, you will have had uh, this, this widespread belief about race, right? Uh, that that is is simply a ref is simply reflected in this. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, um, before we play this, um, this is like a fast forward into what happened here in America as uh, racist uh, uh, ideas have been turned into something that was marketized, something that was about entertainment, something that you know was in the consumer space. All right, and, and this is during the time of, of, uh, of a highly segregated America, and prior to that, uh, a reflection of the Jim Crow era, right? Uh, all right, so we're gonna, look at, we're gonna look at this, and then I'll stop you uh, in a moment. And this, this is from the Jim Crow Museum. Ask yourself the question, if you grow up, and growing up you see literally thousands of examples in cartoons, in movies, in books, and in real life of blacks being the victims of pain, and the victims of aggression, and also the perpetuators, what seeds does that plant? 
what we try to do in the entire museum is to reemphasize that the pieces in here are caricatures. They are not real people. It's a distortion. It's a lie. Many people who come to the Jim Crow Museum have little or no knowledge of Jim Crow. So we began the experience inside the museum with a display about Jim Crow, the character, and then we move into Jim Crow when it become a synonym for racial segregation. This wall here is a blown up version of an 1832 sheet music, which was called Jim Crow. You have here the silhouette form of Thomas Rice, one of the early blackface performers in the US who put blackface makeup on, got on stage and pretended to be a black character. He did not create blackface stage performances, but what he did do was to make the Jim Crow persona popular in the United States and across the world. This section of the museum <clears throat> actually has two of the ways we think of Jim Crow. One, Jim Crow as a blackface form of entertainment. Mistral shows both shaped and reflected attitudes toward African Americans. Imagine if you were a white American, you didn't know a lot of African Americans, and the only depictions or portrayals of African Americans that you saw were from the minstrel stage. There you would find, dressed in blackface, white Americans pretending to be African Americans, and then later, African Americans darkening their skins, pretending to be even darker African Americans, acting as buffoons and idiots and the like. Those shows. Thank you. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to show that just to kind of give you uh, a visual for this. And just think about this. I mean, these are- Ask these yourself are the question. That, if these are things that people uh, would be very familiar with at this time. You know, to us, it's startling. To us, to us it's, it's infuriating. Uh, but these are things that people would have been very comfortable with, would have bought. These are products that they would have purchased, right? Uh, and in some cases, these are toys that they would have played with. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, now this is a more contemporary piece. This is by Michael Ray Charles, uh, titled Forever Free, uh, Bamboozled. I actually spelled it wrong. He spells it with an O here. This is the correct way to spell bamboozled, but he spelled it intentionally with an O, like a bomb, right? Bomboozled. Uh, and it's a painting that uh, he did in 1997. Now I have a question, like what, you know, what, is your reaction to a piece like this? Like, why would he, as, as an African-American, as somebody who's very, very serious in the conversations about race and also uh, a scholar in black studies, why would he make a painting like this? Anybody wanna tackle that? All right, it's all right. So for the sake of time, I'll just tell you. So I want to talk a little bit about something called Afro-pessimism. And uh, that, that's largely the influence in his work. And so what Afro-pessimism is, it's a critical framework that describes the ongoing effect of racism, colonialism, uh, and all the historical processes of enslavement, uh, including like the transatlantic slave trade and their impact on structural conditions as well as personal and subjective and lived experience and embodied reality. So all of that's happening in his work. And uh, one of the things that he confronts in his work is this, uh, this, this kind of performance, uh, this uh, perform, I forget how he call, I forget how he, uh, how he described it, but it's about, it's about performing, right? And it, it's about um, being reduced to a, a, a fungible object or a consumable item, 
kind of a thing. And, and so horrific on purpose to point out the horrific nature of this past. I want to reference right now something that uh, was true in Nazi Germany. Like, uh, it's very important that children are taught about their history so that they're sensitive to it and they will never, ever, ever do that again. It is a great shame to them, right? Uh, one of the reasons why they don't have the death penalty in Germany, um, and I said Nazi Germany, I mean post-Nazi Germany, so I apologize. Um, uh, now, they don't have the death penalty because they say, how could they possibly have the death penalty after all of the things that they have done, right, in their history? It's one of the reasons why they don't have it. So they have a very different kind of attitude uh, about their past because of the education that they've had. And so Michael Ray Charles is interested in kind of creating the same thing, right? He's kind of interested in creating the same thing. All right, let's go on to the next slide. When I say same thing, I mean the same kind of uh, attitude. We have to learn to hate these, these parts of our culture, but we also have to be willing to look at it and take it very seriously. It did happen, right? But we have to condemn it. Okay, so this next slide I need to give context to. Uh, this definition here, fascism, uh, this is something that is motivating the next artist, Titus Kafar, and uh, this term in, in dealing with extreme authoritarian or oppressive or intolerant views or practices, uh, He's interested in that in the sense that there's a lot of nostalgia, you know, of, of American exceptionalism and nationalism. And, you know, it's, it's this idea of this sort of white hero, kind of a trope, kind of a concept that he's addressing. Let's go ahead and take a look. And so he masterfully paints uh, or recreates these paintings of, of uh, antiquity. And then he does this. <laughs> You know, and it's incredibly beautiful and powerful and well painted. So this is uh, this is all uh, canvas painting, with the exception of the nails that are driven into this, completely uh, addressing um, this image in, in in this particular way, and just dealing with that fascism. Let's go on to the next slide, and we're going to hear from him a little bit. I love museums. Have you guys ever been to the Natural History Museum? Oh, yeah. Right. In New York City? So, one of the things that I do is I take my kids to the museum. Recently, took them to the Natural History Museum. Have my two sons with me, Savian and Davin. And we go into the front entrance of the museum, and there's that amazing sculpture of Teddy Roosevelt out there. You guys know which one I'm talking about. Teddy Roosevelt is sitting there with one hand on the horse, bold, strong, sleeves rolled up. I don't know if he's bare chested, but it kind of feels like it. <laughs> and on the left hand side of him is a Native American walking. And on the right hand side of him is an African American walking. And as we're moving up the stairs, getting closer to the sculpture, my oldest son, who's nine, says, Dad, how come he gets to ride and they have to walk? It stopped me in my tracks. It stopped me in my tracks. There was so much history that we would have to go through to try to explain that. And that's something I try to, try to do with them anyways. It's a question that I probably would have, would have never really asked. But fundamentally what he was saying was, that doesn't look fair. Dad, that doesn't look fair. And why is this thing that's so not fair sitting outside of such an amazing institution? And this question got me wondering, is there a way for us to amend our public sculptures, our national monuments? Not erase them, but is there a way to amend them? Now, I didn't grow up going to museums. That's not, that's not my history. My mother was 15 years old when I was born. She is amazing. My father was struggling with his own things for most of my life. If you really want to know the truth, 
the only reason I got into art is because of a woman. There was this amazing, amazing, fantastic, beautiful, smart woman, four years older than me, and I wanted to go out with her. But she said, you're too young and you're not thinking about your future. So I ran on down to the junior college, registered for some classes, <laughs> ran on back, and basically was like, I'm thinking about my future now. <laughs> can, can, can we go out? <laughs> For the record, she's even more amazing. I married her. <laughs> so when I randomly ran down to the junior college and registered for classes, I really wasn't paying attention to what I was registering to. <laughs> so I ended up with an art history class, and I didn't know a thing about art history. But something amazing happened when I went into that class. For the first time in my academic career, my visual intelligence was required of me. For the first time. The professor would put up an image, bold strokes of blues and yellows, and say, who's that? And I go, that's Van Gogh. Clearly, that is Van Gogh. I got this. <laughs> I got a B in that class. <laughs> For me, that was amazing. In high school, let's just say, I wasn't a great student, okay? In high school, my GPA was .65. <laughs> Decimal point first, six, five. So me getting a B was huge, huge, absolutely huge. And because of the fact that I realized that I was able to learn things visually that I couldn't learn in other ways, this became my strategy, this became my tactic for understanding everything else. I wanted to stay in this relationship, things were going well, I decided let me keep taking these art history classes. One of the last art history classes I will not forget, I'll never forget, was one of those survey art history classes. Anybody ever have one of those survey art history classes where they try to teach you the entire history of art in a single semester? I'm talking about cave paintings and Jackson Pollock, like just crunched together all in the same. It doesn't really work, but they try anyway. Well, at the beginning of the semester, I looked at the book, and in this 400-page book was about a 14-page section that was on black people in painting. Now, this was a crammed-in section that had representations of black people in painting and black people who painted. It, it was poorly curated. <laughs> let's, let's, let's just put it that way. Nonetheless, I was really excited about it. Because in all the other classes that I had, we didn't even have that conversation. We didn't talk about it at all. So imagine my surprise when I get to class and on the day that we're supposed to go over that particular chapter, my professor announces, we're going to skip this chapter today because we do not have time to go through it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry, hold on. Professor, professor, I'm sorry. This is a really important chapter to me. Are we gonna go over it at any point? Titus, we don't have time for this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please, I really need to understand it. Clearly the author thinks that this is significant. Why are we skipping over this? Titus, I do not have time for this. Okay, last question, I'm really sorry here. Um, when can we talk? Because we need to talk. <laughs> I went to her office hours. I ended up getting kicked out of her office. I went to the dean. The dean finally told me, I can't force her to teach anything. And I knew in that moment, if I wanted to understand this history, if I wanted to understand the roles of those folks who had to walk, I was probably gonna have to figure that out myself. So, above you right here on the slide is a painting by Franz Hals. This is one of the kinds of images that was in that chapter. I taught myself how to paint by going to museums and looking at images like this. I want to show you some. I made this. 
I, I made some alterations. You'll see there are some slight differences in the painting. All this art history that I had been absorbing helped me to realize that painting is a language. There is a reason why he is the highest in the composition here. There is a reason why the painter is showing us this gold necklace here. He's trying to tell us something about the economic status of these people in his paintings. Painting is a visual language where everything in the painting is meaningful, is important, it's coded. But sometimes, because of the compositional structure, because of compositional hierarchy, it's hard to see other things. This silk is supposed to tell us also that they have quite a bit of money. There's more written about dogs in our history than there are about this other character here. Historically speaking, in research on these kinds of paintings, I can find out more about the lace that the woman is wearing in this painting than I, the manufacturer of the lace, than I can about this character here, about his dreams, about his hopes, about what he wanted out of life. I, I, I want to I show you something. Look, I, I, I don't want you to think that this is about eradication. It's not. The, the oil that you saw me just put inside of this paint is linseed oil. It becomes transparent over time. So eventually what's going to happen is these faces will emerge a little bit. What I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to show you is how to shift your gaze just slightly, just momentarily, just momentarily to ask yourself the question, why do some have to walk? What is the impact of these kinds of sculptures at museums? What is the impact of these kinds of paintings on some of our most vulnerable in society? Seeing these kinds of depictions of themselves all the time. I'm not saying erase it. We can't erase this history. It's real. We have to know it. I think of it in the same way we think of... Let me step back, step back a second. Do you remember, you remember old school cameras? where when you took a picture, you actually had to focus, right? You put the camera up, and if I wanted you in focus, I would move the lens a little to the left, and you would come forward. I could move the lens a little to the right, and you would go back, and the folks in the background would come out. I'm just trying to do that here. I'm trying to give you that opportunity. I'm trying to answer that question that my son had. I want to make paintings I want to make sculpture. Okay, so with that, because we're a little over, I want to respect your time and I want you guys to have an opportunity to analyze this stuff. I mean, I know you've been kind of, that's not really a, a fair word <laughs> because it's like that quick, but I, I want you guys to have some time to process a lot of the things you've heard, a lot of the things that you saw, hopefully uh, as we've just kind of, really done what what drawing is drawing is walking a line around a thought and so we've drawn this kind of line loosely if you will line through uh, the story of race and, and just how artists right now are trying to change that story and trying to really address that narrative uh and i wanted to give you guys a chance to just kind of put all that together that's why i'm like tying it all together in these words right now uh uh 
I'm glad to know that we have just a few minutes buffer because we went long. But, but anyway, um, there, there are more things to see in my slides and I think that that's going to be out for you guys. Isn't that right? So yeah, y'all can, can watch more of him. You can see more of the Jim Crow Museum. You can also hear from other artists as well. But again, I just want to give you time to just maybe say something if you wanted to, because this, this is a lot. <laughs> It's spell. You guys have any any thoughts? Anything that you might have noticed in that painting, uh, in that work that he's doing? You have any thoughts about anything that we've discussed so far? Uh, and again, just to recap you know this is a loose line drawn around the narrative of race all right uh and uh it's my intent was to really just sort of open this up for you to think about to identify those key texts which we did um really to connect those racist ideas with the objects that represented them and then just kind of give you guys this chance as you walk away from this to really process this to analyze this later, maybe you go back and you read the text or you go back and you look at this presentation again, and then you critique some of those ideas and just give yourself the opportunity to, to, to be didactic, right? To inform yourself of these things. Um, and and I I'll tell you, I mean, it, it really has helped me. Uh, it's brought a certain kind of peace in my life, if you will. You kind of feel crazy, right? Am I crazy? Is there something wrong with me? No. Uh, absolutely not. You know, uh, that was me. That's how I thought. And um, it was because I was operating from a false narrative. So anyway, I just want to thank you guys for your time. Uh, that was just really amazing to get to share with you. Uh, and, and I appreciate uh, just this, this, uh, this talk because it's helped me to kind of put a lot of this stuff together uh, in my own thinking. <laughs> No, thank you, sir. Um, and any questions, uh, feedback for for our speaker? I could hear me, right? I am working. Did y'all? Do y'all? I mean, do you have a familiarity with this stuff, or or is this all new to you? It's kind of like shocking and overwhelming, and um, it's like. It's like new, but it's not new because like, I know a little bit about it, but not like a whole lot. So it, it was like interesting to like learn more about it. Awesome. How many of you do Audible? How many of you are Audible listeners? Anybody an Audible listener out there? Y'all listen to Audible audiobooks? Nope. <laughs> Man, I tell you, it's a really uh, helpful way to, to digest books if you don't have a lot of time to sit there and read books of interest. Um, I, I don't always use Audible, you know, because you got to pay for the books and I'm cheap. My wife has, has like a subscription and she buys a lot of books for herself and for the kids. I'll do it occasionally. Um, but I'll check them out from the library too. I'll check out audio books and and these books are available um, as library books in different library uh, access points. I use Libby, which combines different libraries together electronically. So that's just a way to listen to these books if you have an interest there. And uh, I will avail myself to maybe offline talk about any of these books or any other books or just like a course of study, like where do I even begin with this? 
you know, I'm a visual artist. I'm interested in the things that these artists are doing. Who else do you know of? That kind of thing. So I'm available offline for, you know, anything and everything uh, in regards to this topic. And something else, you know, just, just on the artist side, and then I'll shut up after that. Um, <laughs> you know, as, a, as an artist of color, you, you feel this kind of burden or responsibility to make work that's about race, but many of us are not interested in making work about race. In fact, it's, it's like we want to run from this thing. It's, it's like this um, cloud that follows you around your whole life, and it's very difficult to just be your imperfect self. Uh, and so there are a lot of artists that don't do any work about race at all, artists of color. They're doing work about many, many other things. But what I think I'm realizing here in this late moment is just how race, how much race has affected all of us across the whole world. And so you as young people are in this profoundly interesting time to really change that. I mean, we're talking about a global thing, you know, like we're in a global pandemic. This is a global uh, problem. It hovers over all of us and you have a chance to really change that story. And so being didactic, informing yourself and preparing yourself to be an excellent contributor in life and holding your world accountable is, is, is not only an investment in your own life now, but in the future of the world. So just with that, I just wanna say I appreciate you guys for your time and, and I'm here to talk about this and anything else I wanna talk about, if y'all wanna connect later. Um. So it would be okay if I share your email, um, the one that we have on file with students? Absolutely. Okay, I will do that. Um, if students do not have any more questions, concerns, um, you know, we, we thank uh, Mr. Connolly for, for this great uh, insight. Um, and I mean, it should open us up more um, because um, everything that he talked about has affected us, has affected our parents, uh, and has affected you know our ancestors. Uh, and this tied, you know, with, with what Mr. Douglas was talking about, um, you know, how you know all of this was in, in contribution to uh, slavery uh, of how the upper bound programs were created, uh, were to give individuals that never had opportunities for higher education to be able to educate themselves um, because, you know, people didn't want persons of color to be educated, right? Um, because they didn't want to empower them and allow them to think. Um, and now it is our job to think more critical uh, about different things. Um, and l like the, the TED Talk uh, individual was talking about, I forgot his name, sorry, uh, about how he was talking about um, not to erase uh, the past uh, because we need to learn uh, what happened, uh, but to focus on the individuals that were impacted. Uh, I think that that was, that was, uh, that was, to me, that was important, right? Because we really never, uh, we, we focus on, you know, what happened, uh, but never want to learn about who it happened to. Um, and, and I feel once we learn those two things, we can be more critical and, and uh, become empowered to, to drive that change because you are all that change. I mean, you know, we're, we're older individuals. Uh, all we can do is just present these ideas, um, th this, this theories, these thoughts, uh, but it's up to you to act on uh, what you want to act on. No, but thank you again, uh, um, Mr. Connolly. If you have anything else before you leave, uh, if not, thank you, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Sounds good.